Good evening and welcome everyone to our philosophical cafe. Um, I thought I should begin tonight by saying that it is almost a year since we began uh, this project. Um, this is the philosophical cafe number 39. And the first was sometimes in March 2020 when uh, pandemic was just a, a new thing and um, lockdown began in Romania. So we thought of ways of being together other than uh, in person. And we came up with this project, which was called at that time, uh, Philosophy After Dark. So Philosophy After Dark was a kind of acknowledging of the fact that uh, we are both doing it in the evenings, but we're also doing it in very, very special times. Well, one year of philosophy after dark, we are seeing a bit of light at the end of the tunnel due to vaccination. Uh, we hope that uh, we can go back now for good to our regular title, which is the Philosophical Cafe. Um, and the Philosophical Cafe is, a, is a, a new kind of space of discussion which aims to bridge a gap between more um, specialized academic debates and uh, stories, questions, and discussions that are accessible to a wider public. We have two audiences every Friday, one together with us on Zoom, and another one uh, listening and, and watching us on YouTube and we aim to take questions so from both this audience. Now, tonight we are going to talk about Newton. What exactly we are going to talk about Newton, I will uh, ask our co my co-organizer, Georgiana Hedeshan, to tell us and also to introduce our guest tonight. Joe, please. Yes, hello. Um... Thank you for this introduction. And I liked how the, the sirens were a bit in the background while you were speaking about the, the COVID situation. <laughs> it's still ongoing. So we're, uh, we're trying to, uh, to make do as we can. And hopefully it will be over by summer if we're, if we're lucky in the vaccines work. Um, so um, welcome uh, to a new installment of the Philosophical Cafe. Uh, I'm jo Georgiana Hedison from University of Oxford. Um, and today, again, we will be discussing one of the giants of science and philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, Isaac Newton. Now, our traditional view of Newton has been colored by his scientific achievements, of course, the, beginning with the gravity and the optics. Uh, we also think of him as the archetypal genius, uh, the, the person that is focused, uh, but fundamentally uncomplicated. Uh, the person that stays uh, solitarily solving matters of mathematics and astronomy and physics. Uh, but in the last decades, this image of Newton has undergone a major revision uh, as his manuscripts have made way to a public audience and the other side of other sides of Newton have become uh, evident. So no longer just the physics. So we have started to understand that this Newton, uh, the complete Newton had many interests besides physics. And new scholarship has particularly evidenced the importance of religion and alchemy in his thought and practice. Now, uh, last autumn, we had uh, the chance to hear uh, Bill Newman, Professor Bill Newman from uh, Indiana University talk about uh, Newton's alchemical pursuits. And uh, today we have the opportunity of understanding his religious quest with Professor Rob Eilif from Oxford University. <clears throat> Now, Professor Eilif is the author of a striking book that challenges our formal view of Newton. And here it is. Everyone should show, everyone has this, I assume, or at least borrowed it and read it. Uh, this is the Priest of Nature, the Religious Worlds of Isaac Newton. 
the book reads as a new and engaging intellectual history of Newton up to circa 1700 and highlights his unserving dedication to religious matters. Uh, joining me, of, of course, in hosting this session is Donna Jalobanu and Grigore Vida from University of Bucharest. So Rob, uh, welcome to our informal discussion. Um, Newton spent an enormous amount of time on such topics as the interpretation of the Bible, the history of the early Christian church, the decoding of the apocalypse, or the Revelation, the book of Revelation in the Bible, and reconstructing the original ancient religion of humanity. Why, why did he do such things? Let's start with a simple and complicated answer at the same time. What was his motive for doing, carrying on all this research? Uh, well, thank, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to be here. Uh, and to have, have an audience. Um, th that's a very difficult question in terms of uh, motivation. I mean, obviously we, we don't know. Um, we, we do know a lot about his background. Uh, we know that um, he was brought up uh, in the, uh, he was born just as the English civil wars were starting. His father died before he was born. Uh, he was born in a religious environment, so his um, his maternal uncle uh, was a, a clergyman. Um, there were other members of the of his family that, who were also clergymen. His mother uh, married uh, a, 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 the clergyman of the local parish two miles away when he was uh, just two, and she left him alone. I think for for a, for a long time, Newton remembered that he was brought up by his grandmother. Um, which is a very strange thing. I mean, his mother was only two miles away, but N Newton remembered that he was brought up by his grandmother. And I think that that fits into a, 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 a kind of independence that I think is at the core, the bedrock uh, ethic underlying Newton's, uh, Newton's life. Um, I mean, he has religious values as well, but there's an ethic of uh, critical independence that I think is, is very important. Um, we, we don't have uh, a lot of evidence from uh, the period before he went to Trinity College, Cambridge. We don't have a lot of evidence of him doing any uh, religious um, research, but we know that the school that he went to was a, a one that was uh, strict in terms of religion, both in the 1650s and afterwards. And then when uh, after the restoration of Charles II in 1660, which constituted the end of the re Republic experiment. Um, Newton was part of Trinity College, which was, um, as, as some people put it at the time, the, the most prestigious college, as they thought, in the world, which is a, a slight degree of Anglo-centrism there. But the kind of religion that he experienced there was very different from the one that was prevalent in England in the 1650s. Um, and we, we, know that, we, we know that Newton was interested in religious questions. Um, throughout his life, but his dedication to religious study, I think, starts in the middle of the 1670s. And the, there are lots of pieces of evidence, um, really, of him becoming bored uh, or upset with natural philosophy, with science, particularly the science of optics, because he was he felt he was being dragged into uh, disputes, uh, and he he retired. Uh, into the worlds of alchemy and theology at the same time as he, uh, he, he deliberately refused to take holy orders in 1675, which I think, again, is really important for understanding who Newton is or was. He was a, a layman and he deliberately chose to be a layman, uh, I think, because it gave him the, the freedom uh, to, to be the independent, critical reader of religion. That he wanted to be and of course the end result of that was uh the the kind of religion religious views he he came to very quickly were extremely radical not merely heterodox but heretical rob you, may i interrupt you yeah, just yeah. for a moment yeah. to ask you the following yes. in a way many people most of modern philosophers were extremely interested in religion yeah 
and they did work and some of them wrote works that might be qualified as theological. They were interested in talking, they were interested in thinking, questioning, understanding God <clears throat> uh, to, to a, such an extent that some people are talking about this kind of the lay theologians of the 17th century, okay, Descartes and Boyle and everyone was thinking about God. And yet, when we think of the kind of theology natural philosophers were doing, that's mostly natural theology. And their God is integrated in a way with their natural philosophical studies. And yeah. it's a very big difference between what these modern philosophers were doing and what was Newton doing. Yeah. I think Can that's a great point. Can you tell out a yeah. bit what was, in what way was Newton special? <clears throat> I, I think that's a very good, the very good point. Um, because one of the things I wanted to do was to bring together some sort of different uh, historical fields. I mean, there, there was a historical field that had grown up in the 1960s with, or even earlier perhaps, but particularly in the 1960s with the work of Ted McGuire, um, which, which looked at the, the metaphysical theology of Isaac Newton. Uh, and, and it was, if you like, hyper-intellectualist. Um, and very, very interesting and significant. But Maguire wanted to relate it much more to the work of Principia and Optics, um, to um, philosophy of science, if you want to call it that, uh, to the conceptual foundations of Newton's science. So, in it, so the Maguirean analysis of uh, Newton's metaphysics uh, was related to Newton's science, as, as indeed it should be. But with the increasing um, availability, particularly through the Newton project of these millions of words of prophecy and church history, I, I wanted to bring these together. It, there's hardly anyone else that I know who is a natural philosopher who did this kind of deep prophetic research, this, this incredibly um, intense uh, analysis, investigation into uh, church history and into prophecy. Um, most of the people who, you know, nearly all the people we know who did the kind of thing that Newton did, uh, they were divines. So they were people in holy orders. Um, and the, I think the proper context is, is England. And the proper context is, the, is, is English uh, academic theology for understanding what Newton set out to do. Um, but there's hardly anyone else did anything like that. Uh, and it, that, that makes him quite extraordinary. So we, we don't have to work too hard as we do maybe with many of the other natural philosophers and also the other heroes of, of the Enlightenment. We don't have to work hard to work out whether Newton actually believed uh, these, um, these things he was writing about because he obviously did. Uh, and he believed them with a great passion. There, there's no doubt um, that Newton was committed in his heart, if he did have one, uh, and also in his mind, uh, to the idea that Christianity had been corrupted and that it, he was specially chosen to decipher the Bible uh, to uncover how this corruption had happened. So it makes him very different from these other people. There is also, of course, the, the issue that we have his manuscripts, of course, which we probably don't as many for other philosophers. So, uh, and of course the question that appears is why did the manuscript survive? And I mean, why did he never publish them? And the, the issue of publication is of course that when you publish, uh, you're probably more careful about what you say, you know, the, um, let's say that uh, it's a bit more polished, it's, uh, you know, there's a certain discourse, but in his case, you get the raw thing. <laughs> so you get him actually saying what he's thinking. And uh, this is the, the wonderful thing about these manuscripts and their survival, of course. There are, there are many difficult questions with regard to why Newton didn't publish things. I mean, he, he wrote things where he, it's clear he's writing for himself, but he's still hedging about the, the nature of the audience. 
the nature of the audience, the implied audience in his private writings is still difficult. It's hard to know what kind of person he's writing for. Um, and that goes to the, so before we even get into the way in which his writings did actually seep out into the public, um, that there's a very interesting question about uh, the, the level of uh, theological sophistication that his writings would have been intended for. You know, the, the, the kind of people who he, um, who he wanted to read his writings, it, it's sometimes difficult to work out uh, who these were. Um, I mean, Newton believed that the Bible, uh, in essence, was simple. It was written for poor people, uh, ignorant meaning unlearned. Um, and that, that idea, I think, goes to the heart of uh, Newton's view about the corruption of religion. So religion had been corrupted by people later like Leibniz, who had brought metaphysics uh, into the early church. I mean, the, his, his later theological research uh, is, is about the first and second and third centuries after Christ. Um, and this is where um, people began to imbibe. I don't talk about this in the book. I talk about it elsewhere. But, but this is where people, uh, Christian groups began to um, swallow pagan philosophies, bring in uh, some Kabbalistic, uh, Gnostic philosophies, uh, metaphysics that, that complicated and um, diluted the, the true faith. So Newton is committed to, uh, at one level, to writing for uh, an audience that, that's quite simple in terms of its theological understanding. And that goes along with his idea of who he is. No, not as a, a prophet, but as someone who is chosen to spread the word. That's what he says, um, that, that he is a special gift of understanding and he's been chosen to spread the word. However, and I think this is something that uh, a, a lot of people have picked up on the book, a uh, uh, priest of nature, you know, his, his writings were technically difficult. His theological writings are technically difficult, even by the standards of the time. Um, so this is a layman um, who is engaging in the most abstruse kinds of theology and who the audience is for that is very unclear. Um, it, it's obvious that he believed that he was a, a special kind of person um, who uh, you know, was, was able to, as he saw it, s someone of experience um, who was licensed to deal with the, the much more abstruse aspects of the Bible, including prophecy. I think that's important. Um, his writings on prophecy are, are the things that are closest to his heart because he thinks he can decipher the visions of prophecy in Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel and Revelation in the same way that he can decipher the, uh, the truths of, of the natural world. I mean, I mean, he thinks that they are there to be comprehended, to, to be understood, and he thinks that he is the person to do that. And not only that, he is the person to spread the word. But what he finds, or what he found in his research in theology was something that was despicable. You know, he, he found out that the, the core assumption of Christianity, of Orthodox Christianity, was a terrible diabolical fraud. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity is false. It's polytheism, and it lies at the heart of uh, Christianity. And for Newton, um, it meant that Orthodox Christianity, whether you're a Protestant or Roman, a Roman Catholic, or indeed a member of the, the Orthodox churches, it had been fatally tainted. Uh, and this, this tells you immediately why he didn't publish before a, a wider audience. As I said in the, in the book, you know, if, if he... He wouldn't have been subject to the kind of capital punishments that existed in the first part of the 17th century. But he would never have been allowed to uh, be a, a justice of the peace, uh, a master of the mint, president of the Royal Society. He would never have been allowed to be Lucasian professor or a fellow of Trinity College. Uh, and he would have been a, a social outcast. Um, that's why he had to keep his work private. But uh, what, uh, at the same time, you're, you're highlighting the fact that uh, he intended at some point to publish some things anonymously or 
I mean, b basically, there was all this anonymous publication of uh, anti-Trinitarian uh, doctrines and various radical enlightenment kind of uh, radical. Um, um, so, so, but he didn't. So, I mean, uh, what stopped him? I mean, if he wanted to preach the word, I mean, what? Why did he stop doing it? I mean, why? Why didn't he publish anonymously or? in some way that uh, would, let's say, not affect him directly? Well, he did, uh, he, he did it on a number of occasions. Um, there, there, I think there are two things. I mean, what, one is he tried to um, have published an anonymous Latin translation of his English analysis of 1 Timothy 3.16 and 1 John 5.7 to 8. Um, and he, he got cold feet even about that in, uh, 1690 to 92. Um, I, I think he, he really is very sensitive about any of this coming back to him in any way whatsoever. But he did engage in, in what I think is, is unwisely called scribal publication. I mean, he had a number of different strategies for releasing his information to different people. Um, you know, sometimes he just, I, I think he, uh, he left materials on a desk in his room. And then I think he walked out of the room and let people copy his manuscripts for about half an hour or an hour. And then he came back in again. And that's a form of scribal publication. Um, we, we know he had trusted people, uh, William Whiston, Samuel Clark, Hopton Haynes. These are people who are well known. And he clearly revealed uh, what he believed to them. Uh, that, that these are uh, you know, hyper trustworthy individuals, but there aren't, I think many more than that. But there are rumors that uh, circulate um, as, as a number of historians have shown, you know, there, there, there are many rumours about Newton's um, heterodoxy, I think. Uh, there, there, there's a, there are various locutions for describing his unusual thoughts. Um, and there are various ways in which some of his friends tried to account for those unusual thoughts. Um, you know, that, that he, he spent so much time on natural philosophy that it was a kind of religion. Uh, and that his, his Principia served as a proof of how religious he was. Um, some people said that the, the amount of time he spent studying the Bible rather than going to church was an indicative of, again, his, uh, his piety and so on. So there are different ways in which his friends account for that during his lifetime. But then pretty soon after he died, um, William Whiston, who was his successor as Lucasian professor, really blew the lid on, on what Newton really believed. Uh, and I, I think it's, that then it becomes very interesting as to why it is that there's, there's a great rescue operation for about um, 200 years to try and save Newton's uh, orthodoxy against all the odds. But of course the papers w were not really re released uh, for, for study until the early 1970s. Um, so people didn't know what was in them until the 1970s, and therefore it was easy for people, I think, to, 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 to try and rescue uh, Newton's orthodoxy, uh, even though the evidence that was out, um, even in the middle of the 19th century, made it quite clear that he was deeply opposed to traditional orthodox uh, doctrine within Christianity. Now, the fact that uh, he wasn't prepared to renounce his career in natural philosophy by revealing his true views, by his heresy, does this mean maybe that uh, natural philosophy was still more important to him than his heresy or making his heresy public? Um, I... I there are a few pieces of writing from towards the end of his life. And I think I was, I was careful. I should say that the book really is about the first half of his career. Um, that I, um, <laughs> I, I have an undertaking to do a, se a second book um, called uh, uh, Lord of All, uh, which deals with the second part of Newton's career. But in, in the, in the latter part of Newton's career, he wrote um, some, position pieces really about what an ideal ecclesiastical polity was and, and what the ideal relationship was between the Church of England and, and Britain, and also what the ideal nature of the Church of England was. And, and one of the things I think he says um, about the Church of England is that 
it, it should be hyper latitudinarian. That means that the, the strength of the Church of England is its incredibly broad swallow. So a corollary of that, or if you like, an un underpinning of that view is, is that the Church of England should include people like Newton. So it's not, I think, I think that's important. It's not, a, it's not insincerity, I think, at one level that stops Newton from publishing. It's just that um, the time isn't yet right for the Church of England uh, to realise that if it's consistent, it should allow people like Newton to be a member of the Church of England. It's just that the time isn't right. Uh, if you were to ask me on a personal level, you know, was Newton afraid of um, the, the, the pariah status that would have uh, eventuated with this material coming out? Then yes, he certainly would have been. Um, you know, in, he lived a long time. He was 84 when he died. And periodically um, from the 1690s onwards, you know, England and then Britain is a, is a state in crisis. It goes through a number of crises. You know, it has this, it has a Dutch uh, king uh, in 1689, and it has a German king in 1714. It, it is a state in crisis. And there, there, are, there are ructions between uh, the high church and the low church people. And Newton's views, I think, are, are deeply problematic at an, on a number of occasions. Um, I mean, one of them is after the second edition of Principia was published in 1713, and people looked at the, the general scolium, which is this um, sort of metaphysical think piece at the end, and said, you know, some people saw a degree of heresy there. And then I think another interesting time is in the right at the start of the 18th century when um, Newton stood uh, in 1702 as. Um, sorry, in 1705, as, as an, a member of parliament and failed to get in. And we know that some of the students at Cambridge, um, I mean, he stood for a, a position as an MP for Cambridge University, even though he was um, no longer Lucasian professor, but a number of students chanted at him that he was, uh, that he engaged in a, a, only in occasional conformity. That is to say, it seems that people had seen through his cover even in the first decade of the 18th century, and that he was somebody who only turned up to church uh, for, uh, for, for uh, appearances sake. So the, the, there's still a bit more research to be done on the, the kind of social context of, of Newton's heresy or his heterodoxy, one should say. I'd like to uh, pick it from where you said that, actually you, you make a very interesting case in the book uh, for uh, Newton feeling the duty to spread the word. And you said it again tonight that somehow as a result of his theological discovery, he felt the need to spread the word. Meanwhile, um, we have, well, if we learn anything about Newton in the past century, um, the first thing that a student of Newton learns, the first thing that a reader of any Newton learns is that Newton was very secretive, very much reluctant to spread any kind of word about anything, mathematics, natural philosophy, yeah. alchemy. Um, Westphal's biography makes Newton a sort of paranoid recluse who doesn't want to publish anything. Um, are you saying that when theology is concerned, he felt more need to spread the word than when the rest of his corpus was concerned? I think the, 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 the management of uh, the public-private uh, division is, is something that Newton wrestles with throughout his career, whether it's alchemy, uh, mathematics, or natural philosophy. Um, I mean, I try to address that in the book, but I, I don't I, I don't purport or I, I don't profess to be able to enter into his head, although I do. Uh, I mean, I've spent so long working on him. I have, I have some degree of understanding of what the guy is, is like. Um, but it, it, there are some remarks from one or two of his followers that uh, Newton um, felt that his work should be preserved, his, his theological writings should be pre preserved and, until the time was more appropriate for his truths to be 
uh, noised or revealed to the world. Um, but, you know, uh, ultimately, I think we, we, we don't, as is the case with a lot of Newton, we don't have independent evidence as to motivation. I mean, all we have is the, we, we have the matters of fact that he didn't publish. And, and I, was, I was very careful, I think, that this goes to the way I do history, but I was very careful to try not to speculate as to what the reasons were for him not uh, publishing, uh, which I think is, it, it, it's not, you know, I've been criticized by one or two people uh, for, for not speculating more and for, for being, in the jargon we call it, for being anti-psychologistic. You know, I, I leave it till the very last moment before I reveal who I think uh, Newton, what, what his personality traits are. Um, but, you know, the, the, this is a, these are complex issues. Uh, it, it, even if his work wasn't heretical <laughs> or heterodox, I think Newton would have been secretive about his theology. Um, I, I think also that, that reflexively Newton did talk about the need for private opinions to remain within one's closet. Um, and so even within the, the kind of uh, religious writings in which he's, he engages, he has a theory built in about the division between public and private, about what is appropriate to oneself, you know, which we might call, uh, I suppose if you take a Hobbesian view, there's a difference between opinion and belief. Um, I mean, Newton doesn't run that language, doesn't abide by the language, but um, certainly there's a distinction between the public profession of faith and one's own private belief. Uh, and Newton, um, and I think this is a political issue, uh, or, or rather it's um, a political theology, if you like, uh, Newton believed that um, other people had no right to uh, access what you believed privately. Um, that you know, these are things to which you and God have the sole rights. Um, what, what is very interesting also is uh, to think about the, um, the spaces, the um, uh, locations, let's say, uh, of uh, Newton's philosophy. Uh, I mean, of course, he starts as being a Cambridge person and he spends all this time uh, in Cambridge up to 1690s or thereabouts. Um, but also he, he starts to have this contact with the Royal Society. Uh, and of course, the Royal Society is the paradigm or the, um, uh, for, for openness, for open knowledge. Uh, so uh, it is interesting in, in thinking to what extent uh, these interactions that he has uh, with the collegiate environment and uh, with the Royal Society shape the way he uh, he responds to to the um, to these issues of how much to publish and how much not to publish. I, I think that's a very good point. I mean, there's, there's a there's a different issue which is about the nature of uh, of English natural philosophy. Um, you know, really from 1630 to 1820. Uh, but particularly in the Royal Society from 1660, you know, it, it is a Baconian natural historical, um, in some cases in the 18th century, a, 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 an almost medical natural historical form of natural philosophy with this, this bizarre sort of riptide ripple between 1703 and 1727 when Newton was president of the Royal Society. I mean, I, I think the, the, the kind of natural philosophy that Newton does um, is one that requires students who are disciples, um, who are close followers, we may say idolaters of, of a master, uh, because it's technically recondite natural philosophy. That's what happens to mathematical natural philosophy. You know, that you, it, you, you, when you have technically difficult, abstruse mathematical natural philosophy, uh, the only way you can pass that on is is through the production, maybe of textbooks, the institution of um, regimes of training inside universities, um, and students who are prepared to devote their lives to somebody like Newton uh, to become a follower. Uh, and and that's not uh, it's not easy to make those 
the, the, the core content of that available to a wide range of people. I mean, th there are mechanisms like public lectures and public books and popularizations that allow uh, people, particularly in polite society in the 18th century, there are ways of getting people to, to grasp some of the basics of the doctrine, but to, to get to the sweet spot, um, you, you need to spend a lot of time devoting yourself to it. Uh, and that necessarily creates a, a sort of Pythagorean uh, structure, you know, a, a, a structure of disciples. Um, and it, and it, it, I, I think it, it gives rise to many of the structural problems in the Newton-Leibniz dispute, um, where I think Newton is really obsessed with the, the, the sort of sociological audience relation structure in which Leibniz engages. Uh, and he sees Leibniz as somebody who is, um, you know, the, uh, this is partly caricature and partly fantasy on Newton's behalf, but you can see that it says a lot about Newton. Um, Newton claims repeatedly in his private writings, uh, Mr. Leibniz has cultivated an army of disciples, whereas I leave truth to sift for itself. So this is Newton, who's got all these disciples that he's put into big positions in universities. Uh, and he's got attack dogs like John Kyle and one or two others. And he, he accuses Leibniz of, um, of manipulating the Republic of Letters by creating his own journal, <laughs> um, by you know, having his own people like Johann Bernoulli um, going out and doing his dirty business. So I, I think that the, the relationship with disciples is really crucial to understanding um, some of these some of these issues, but the the disciple relationship is a is a very intimate one. I think ultimately, it's probably seminarial. I, I think I, I have a student, uh, Lucia Bucciarelli, who's doing some great work on this. Um, but I, I think that the if if we want to go for an origin story for the for the hell of it, um, you know the the social homosocial structures uh, are uh, monastic seminarial. I think, and they that they get imported into uh, a, a set of relationships that that becomes um, clear. I think after Copernicus, and you get a chain of these sorts of relations going down through Newton and and into the 18th century university system. Well, here you have lost me. Don't forget, we are not all in Cambridge and Oxford. So, yeah. how about telling us more? I mean, one of the most interesting thing in your book is that unlike previous biographies of Newton, so yeah, Newton of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century was the solitary genius. And then uh, Westphal's Newton has some disciples and there is a bit of Newton sect moving around in the late 17th century. What your book is saying is that essential to Newton's formation, intellectual formation, and the way he addresses uh, problems in his writings is the collegiate atmosphere in Cambridge, is a sort of intellectual freedom characteristic of a Cambridge college. Now, can you take us a bit into the inside of a Cambridge college of the 17th century and let us know more exactly what you mean by that? Um, yes, uh, I mean, the, the way in which uh, Newton was uh, was brought up at, at undergraduate level um, was was one where he let he read um, in a in a collegiate environment. Uh, he's surrounded by men, uh, by by young men. Some of them want to go into the church. Uh, many of them, uh, particularly the the wealthier ones, uh, uh, want to spend time at, at uh, college. Uh, they're going to become uh, uh, landowners. Um, they're, they're after a different kind of uh, education, um, and, and I think it's uh, it, it's one that is quite similar to the kind of world that Newton despises, in uh, th that he saw as being the the kind of uh, well, the diabolical sociological structure of early monasticism. Um, which in a, a number of his private writings, Newton criticized uh, as being unhealthy. And uh, as I said, uh, in, in many ways, 
uh, a seedbed or a hotbed of uh, diabolical doctrine. And one of the things that I think that's interesting is ab about Newton's account of the fourth and fifth century emergence of monasticism um, is how close some of these structures are to his own uh, university, uh, to his own college. Uh, and I think he has to engage in a, I wouldn't say radical, but a, a, a degree of product differentiation. Um, so in, in, in attacking uh, many of the, the structures and beliefs and um, behaviors of the fourth and fifth century, because I think ultimately that's um, th that's one of the things that's most interesting about his critique of the of the early church. Um, it I I I read off uh, accounts both positive and negative about his experience in um, in a in a Protestant monastery in a sense in Trinity College, Cambridge, um, and the. What, what I wanted to do was to point to the, the ways in which this wasn't just theory or doctrine, uh, but it pointed to the, the care of the self, the way in which one is supposed to live one's life as a godly Christian and as a godly Christian natural philosopher. And, you know, one of the, one of the most interesting discoveries, I suppose, in, in my research over a long period of time was, was finding his, or looking at his critique of, uh, the, the 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 sexual malpractices of monks of the early monastics, and and the way in which he writes in a prescriptive manner, which must be reflexive. It must be the case um, when Newton says that uh, if you're idle, uh, you're liable to start thinking about women, uh, and then that turns to worse things. I mean, that clearly is something that that refers both to himself and to the culture in which he in which he lives. There is a question. Well, there are three questions from uh, Monica Solobon. Um, Monica, I, I would suggest that you ask first the, maybe the first question and then maybe I'll come back to the second and the third a bit later on. Um, would you like to ask the first, the first question? Thank you. Yes, sure. Um, so my first question was more of a historical curiosity. Uh, if I haven't read the whole book, so maybe the, there's this is like a spoiler. Um, when did Newton, or can we identify some sort of moment in his writings when he started to um, kind of distrust the Trinitarian doctrine, um, such as you know? I I don't know if at a personal level must have been something like uh, oh I should believe in Trinitarian doctrine, and then I stumble upon something, and I'm like oh, maybe this is false, or maybe he just had doubts from the beginning and uh, at some point he just thought, okay, maybe I should look into this and see if I can find some evidence. So I'm, I'm curious what kind of, if, if you can tell, of course, because this is very hard to say, not, not necessarily about Newton, but the sort of thing, how would one start to think more seriously and, um, you know, even though embedded in, <laughs> in, in a kind of religious world that takes Trinitarian in one way or another to be true, yeah. like you, you start to seriously question that to, to, to the degree to which you, you have to do and do research to figure it out. Um, I, I, again, I think we have absence of uh, evidence until uh, the very late 1670s. Um, I, we, we, I, we, we know from a letter in 1680 um, from Henry Moore, the Cambridge Platonist, to uh, John Sharp, uh, who's a, a clergyman in London, that, that Moore had been having conversations with Newton. And it, it's clear, given what Moore says, it's clear that Newton has already broken with uh, traditional orthodox uh, Anglicanism. Um, but when he broke, I mean, I would say, you know, two, three, four years earlier, I mean, it has to be um, you know, he, we, we know that from these conversations with Moore that Newton had already had a worked out system, uh, a complex worked out system of uh, prophetic interpretation, which he didn't concoct overnight. Um, but, you know, there's the, the simply no datable evidence that tells us when he uh, when he turned. I mean, some something between around about 1675 to 77 is probably uh, reasonable. 
uh, in in terms of in terms of his dating. I think what's interesting is that a number of the um, a number of the public positions he took up, for example, as an MP in 1689, uh, definitely required him to uh, swear an oath, which which was a commitment to uh, Trinitarianism. Um, and people are, as I said at the start, you know, people at various points in Newton's life um, become anxious about uh, anti-Trinitarianism. Um, but there is there is widespread uh, debate within orthodox circles about what the Trinity means. I mean, it's a great triumph of the uh, Socinians and also from people like John Toland. It's, it's a great triumph of them to force uh, orthodox Anglican divines to try and explain what the Trinity is. I mean, once they start to do that, they've already lost um, for a number of reasons, partly because they, they want to say that it's inexplicable and partly because they soon find out um, in 1690, 91, 92, they soon find out that they disagree amongst themselves about what the Trinity is. And so again, you know, the, the enemies of Orthodox Trinitarianism have a field day uh, because the, the divines disagree amongst themselves. Um, but, but Newton uh, appears to uh, consistently and with sincerity be able to run this you know, profoundly passionate anti-Trinitarian private program while publicly uh, professing an allegiance to the core doctrines uh, of the Articles of the Church of England. What would be interesting right now is to uh, focus a little bit, to go back in time to that pivotal moment that uh, Newton uh, uh, focused on, uh, which was the fourth century uh, and its meaning for him and for, for the others. Uh, so he basically pinned, uh, or, uh, let's say, uh, focused on that, in that period as being uh, <clears throat> fundamental in changing uh, the way Christianity was. And here is uh, where his theory of conspiracy comes in. Yep. Um, Dragos Marshano, I think, has a question. He's a theologian, so um, can you ask the question, Dragos? Yes, thank you. Uh, I've met uh, Professor Aleph uh, a few years ago, and I've mentioned then that I'm uh, trained as a early church historian. So uh, he was happy to, to say that uh, I might have something to to discover yet by studying the uh, sources and the, how Newton read the fathers. And this is what I've been, I've, I've just started to do actually, writing a thesis on the, on the sources and on the Trinity and the, on the, um, his critique, Newton's critique of the patristic paradigm that has developed along across the centuries. So uh, I'm happy that you have published this book that I have here in a, just in a copy, but it's as good as a book. And um, I'm asking you a couple of questions now, uh, if you are so kind to, to reply. Um, I'm concerned um, about the, um, the influence of the um, Platonic thought um, I'm referring here to the Ralph Cudworth and all this, uh, the, the school that I'm not as familiar as with the early church, obviously, and how this influenced the, um, the labeling, the, the way uh, Newton understood the Trinity as a ne neoplatonic corruption or something like that, uh, um, as, or in contrast with how Cudworth may be understood, if I'm understood correctly, that there is a contrast between them. So that's one question. And this, if this relates to the understanding of the Trinity. And then uh, related to that, um, how would you categorize um, Newton's belief that uh, Athanasius and his followers in the fourth century uh, really corrupted the pre-Nicaea or pre-Nicene works 
as to say what they wanted them to say, so long um, as, uh, as of now we have many of the uh, works of the champions, of those who won the war, but very few of those who said the, the truth, but were, uh, were vanquished, were uh, defeated, so that we don't have their works anymore. So um, is, is it true that Newton believed that, uh, how to say, uh, clearly, that Athanasius and his followers uh, really destroyed the works that spoke of of um, the radical monotheism or of, of things like that. Maybe I'm, I've been putting some complicated questions now for, for us, but uh, perhaps you can make them um, palatable to, to, many, to yes. many as well. Um, yeah, the, the, the question of Newton and uh, Platonism. Um, I mean, first of all, Ralph Cudworth's uh, work of 1678 is is part of a, a debate within, uh, you know, a, a very high level complex debate within the Church of England uh, about how to understand the Trinity in the patristic literature. Um, and, you know, Cudworth's solution is to try and find some kind of proto uh, Trinitarian commitment in Plato's own writings. Um, now for, as far as Newton's concerned, um, I think he has a different, slightly different view, but it's based on, he, he, he mines uh, the, the work of Cudworth, because Cudworth's true intellectual system is this, this massive, you know, 950 page work, which, which is this uh, tremendous uh, reservoir of quotations and, and analyses. Um, what Newton thinks is, is that uh, a deviant form of Platonism uh, came into the church uh, via uh, Kabbalism and, and Gnosticism. And this, the, the, the sort of deviance came from uh, a, a sort of a tendency, which he sees, I think this is, a, is clearly a, a kind of Calvinist uh, underpinning of Newton's Protestantism. But you know what Newton takes very seriously and again it lies at the heart of my book he takes very seriously the uh, capacity or the tendency of human beings to mistake the products of their own mind for what exists in the real world and what is really the work of God you know so the mind is a, a factory of idols and the the hand makes what the mind designs and I think what happens with, as, as Newton sees it, is that deviant priests engaging in priestcraft um, sort of solidify um, or uh, put flesh on some of the, the, the platonic ideas as if there are physical emanations. So I, I think early on, quite early on, Newton uh, sees the, 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 the core diabolical uh, corruption of Christianity to be uh, physicalism. Um, you know, which is to uh, understand in a in a physical, physicalist, uh, real way things that are meant symbolically, um, and and that starts right from the very word go within Christianity, um, and it's the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity is is lust. Um, it's the it's carnality. It's the tendency of human beings to uh, put flesh on. Uh, claims that are symbolic and representative. And of course, it lies at the heart of Newton's view of what the, of, of the, the great uh, homoousian uh, consubstantialist um, corruption and heresy of, of, the, of the Council of Nicaea, you know, which is to say, for those of you that <laughs> I don't know, you know, the, 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 the claim as a result of, of Nicaea is that Jesus Christ, the son is consubstantial. That means made of the same substance as God. Um, what that means, it could, it could mean, it depends which part of the Christian world you're in as to what that means. It could mean he's the same essence. Uh, it could mean he's the same substance like in, as in a physical sense. I mean, Newton, Newton's concern is that the, the physicalist interpretation comes to dominate uh, Christianity uh, from the fifth century onwards. 
and his his men his people are wiped out by a conspiracy um and it's a genocidal conspiracy i mean the, the, you know it, it, it's not just that papers are rewritten or lost or destroyed but that large swathes of uh christianity of of the christian world um are, are turned into this uh corrupt polytheistic diabolical religion and, and i should say that newton for those of you that um aren't aware of this i mean newton understands all this in in the form of a sacred history you know it, all of the history of the past and all of the history of the future is written in revelation uh, isaiah uh, daniel and ezekiel if you understand it correctly and perhaps the the most important part of christianity you know the 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 key events in christianity happen in the fourth century and as far as newton's concerned almost nothing happened as, as a result of the reformation i mean it, it, there's almost nothing in newton's writings on the reformation nothing it's all fourth fifth century uh so and it's the striking. result of it, but it's the result of a of the devil coming down to earth. You know, there is a fight in heaven between Michael and the devil and the devil loses and the devil like David Bowie falls to earth. And he, he starts manipulating people like Athanasius. Um, and he believes that Newton, at least in the first part of his career, this is what he believed. And the, you know, the fascinating thing for the historian is that this is the author of the Principia Mathematica. This is the the guy who discovered fractions and fluence, you know, the in, integral and differential calculus. But he believes, that at least early in his career, that the devil is a person who came down to earth and mixed with, um, you know, senior uh, monks, and they 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 spread their evil word uh, across Christianity, and they destroyed almost everybody, but there was a remnant. There were some people who survived, uh, who, were tr who, who knew the truth. Uh, and Newton, I think, does identify with those people, but, uh, but obviously they're hard to come by in 17th and early 18th century England. Oh, when he speaks in the context of the Prisca Sapientia tradition, he seems to be doing exactly what you said, namely giving physical significance to symbols, a temple, vestals, and so on. What is the relation between his view of the Prisca tradition and the history of uh, the corruption of the church? They seem to be opposing, uh, uh, somehow opposed history. One preserves something, the other corrupts. What is the relation between them? I think there's a general, uh, I mean, what, one of the issues I wanted to raise when I wrote the book is, you know, m many historians want to find connections between things. And, and I, I, I call them connectionists. So their, their, their core default assumption is that there must be a connection between different parts of Newton's world. And I, I don't see that. I think there are distinctions, that there are similarities, but there are also deep divisions between parts of Newton's world. But that, that's one of the two or three core um, points I wanted to make in the book is that there is this massive fissure that divides uh, one part of Newton's world, if you like natural philosophy and mathematics from another part of the world uh, where a, a different kind of approach is, is appropriate. If you like a litigious or forensic approach is forensic. In the case of the, the Prisca Sapientia, as, as you've just said, um, you know that there is this this structure of uh, of uh, an original truth that is corrupted um, by uh, in in the case of the original religion it, it's a very simple corruption you know the as he sees it the um, a sort of the, the concentric circles that go out from the sun outwards that are understood by an elite group of people are understood differently by people who um, have a, a kind of physical, uh, we might say, carnal tendency to see the earth as being at the center of everything. And that, that, that move from what was really a true heliocentric Newtonian view 
to a geocentric view is, is again, as you said, it's a, it's a misinterpretation of a series of symbols. And, and that requires somebody to come, you know, a, a, a hero or someone to, to come in and uh, re, rewrite or correct uh, a fault that's, that's been made. Um, I think that the, the, the Prisca Sapientia material, uh, w which is itself composed of maybe three or four different sub projects, but in general, his, his view is that there was a, a kind of syncretic um, scientific and religious knowledge that was held by uh, a group of people that then became lost. And part of that knowledge was Newtonianism. Um, and it, one of the things that we, we may or may not be justified in saying is that Newton identified with the, uh, the, the priests, the, the guardians of this sacred knowledge, and that therefore we can read off what he says about the, the Brahmins uh, and the, the, the learned priests of the, the ancient world as being like himself or perhaps he is like them. Um, but the, the, it, it, it's hard to make the, um, the original of religions material directly comparable to uh, the modern world because one, one doesn't expect natural philosophers of the late 17th century, early 18th century to also be guardians of religious truths. So that there are similarities, but there are also key distinctions. In the past, um, you know, the, the priests were priests of nature and also religious priests. They were the same person. And I think in Newton's time, they're different. Maybe Newton sees his own life as, as an attempt to bring back in his own person that, that kind of uh, coherent uh, series of roles in one person. Rob, let me try to uh, bring into the discussion a series of terms that you have used recently. Yeah. You said uh, Newton believed that the devil came on us on the fourth century. Yeah. Uh, and Newton also wrote the Principia. Now, yeah. was he using the same faculties of the mind when he was addressing these two issues? We have two questions that I would like to introduce. One comes from Moscow, from Daria Drozdrova, who is on YouTube with us. Oh. And she is asking basically the question of what faculties and what kind of instruments was Newton putting into play when discussing uh, the corruption of the church? Was it reason? So was that kind of construction on the same par with doing natural philosophy or was it something different? And then Monica has a question, but maybe we should start with Daria's question and then move to Monica. Oh, <laughs> that's the big question. They were one of the really big questions. Um... What's the similarity between the prophetic stuff, you know, of which there's about five million words that survive, uh, and the the work in uh, the Principia Mathematica? I mean, there are uh, there are differences. Um, I think uh, I try to argue in the book that the the modes of demonstration, the modes of argument, belong to separate disciplines. I mean, they're very different disciplines. In many ways, they're opposed to each other in Newton's mind. Um, you know, one of them, as I said, is, is forensic and litigious. Um, it, it's, it's something that Newton deems to be completely inappropriate in natural philosophy. Um, I think he, on a number of levels, he, he doesn't fit, he, he tries to preserve the distinction between those two, those two realms. Um, but there are similarities b between them. Um, and you know maybe it's in in finding well it, it's both in the dissimilarities and in the similarities that you can discern Newton the man. You know, that's something that I wanted to that I that I believe I believe anyway. You know that 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 we find Newton in the details. Um, and in the in the case of uh, his Principia, we have over a number of decades this this very. Uh, careful, uh, protracted effort to finesse his theory of universal gravitation uh, by means of uh, new, increasingly uh, precise evidence. Um, and there's this, you know, dialectical play between 
uh, his discovery and production of new evidence and the refinement of his theory over the three editions of Principia. <clears throat> but there's clearly something um, almost identical with, the, with his work on prophecy. You know, the, um, he has early on, as I said, a, a fairly sophisticated view of how to read the visions of prophecy in Revelation and how everything is coherent with the, you know, with the numbers and visions in Ezekiel and the really detailed accounts in Isaiah of um, the, the end of the world. And then, of course, the, the more obscure stuff in Daniel, which is less helpful, I think, for him. Um, and his theory gets refined over time um, until it becomes extremely uh, detailed. But he finds more and more evidence in more and more uh, obscure locations to uh, bolster his claims about what happened in the fourth and fifth centuries when, when it all really went wrong. Um, and I think it's, it, it's really interesting to see in, in detail the, the way in which he uh, concocts evidence, he shoehorns evidence, he fudges evidence in uh, prophecy uh, to make it cohere with his, his views about the history of the world. Um, and, and of course, we, we have the usual hermeneutical problems that if, if a piece of evidence prima facie doesn't agree with his uh, theory, then that piece of evidence is tainted. It must have been, uh, it must have been written in certain circumstances that, that mean that one can just move it to one side or else it can be interpreted in, in a different way. Um, but the, the, the whole, you know, the, the coherence between evidence and data remains the same in, in both cases. And in, in terms of reason, I think that's a, a, a great point. I think it's, it's very important uh, you know, one of the, 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 the core similarities that I see between uh, the, the prophetic research and the, the science research is Newton's um, serious problems with hypotheses, which I think he, he thinks as, as products of the imagination. Uh, he has, you know, more problems with hypotheses than almost any other natural philosopher of, of his era. And he has problems with um, false interpretations that are passed off as true interpretations in, in religion. And one of the things he's really concerned about is, I think, passion and emotion um, in religion. I mean, he's deeply opposed to that. That's why you know, calling him a Puritan is, is, is unhelpful, because many Puritans um, place great stress on emotion. Uh, obviously, in, 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 the, in the far in the far limits of Protestantism, you, you get uh, people like Anabaptists and Quakers, you know, for whom some kind of special experience is really significant. Now, for Newton, uh, those people are always deluded. Those people are uh, people who believe that they found the truth, uh, but as far as Newton's concerned, that they um, their their passions have been allowed to run riot, <coughs> and they have destroyed the capacity of reason uh, to, govern, to govern research. And I think Newton believes both in natural philosophy and also in uh, his prophetic research uh, and his religious research as a whole. He believed that what he was doing was rational. And he has a clear division between what's rational and what's uh, not rational. Um, by our standards, of course, um, we, we don't live, most of us anyway, some, some people do in North America and, and elsewhere, but most of us don't live in a world where we believe Newton's prophetic discoveries to be true. Um, uh, we, we think that, we tend to think that Newton's prophetic research is, as the Victorian said, a, a, a complete waste of time. Um, he did all the stuff because uh, he lived in the age he did, or he loved writing. Um, he was snared by his beautiful handwriting. Uh, it's very difficult to make sense of uh, all this detailed, uh, insane writing on prophecy. Um, you know, Victorians wrote some amusing things about anyone who tried to take this seriously would go mad uh, and they would never come out of it, uh, except in a lunatic asylum. Um, and here I am. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> you know, the, it, I, I think it is fascinating to watch um, 
it, it is fascinating to, to try and look at the similarities and differences between different parts of Newton's thought. And I, I, I don't have the, obviously I don't profess to have the last word. I, I'm very interested to see how other people use whatever I've done or don't use it and go to the materials and see and test themselves against what even in the 17th and 18th centuries was understood to be technically difficult uh, or even um, dubious kinds of kinds of research. You know, there aren't many people doing the kind of stuff Newton does. You know, the 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 English apocalyptic tradition of um, Brightman and Mead and Napier and so on. It's not very popular. It's very abstruse, and it's abstruse, so it's difficult, but it's also dangerous because you know. Well, certainly after the English civil wars and the Republic, you know, people, people are scared of the power of prophecy. You know, the, those people who claim that the end of the world is just around the corner, you know, that they still have a great deal of kudos and cachet in the late 17th century. And I think it's the job of the elites to diminish that power of prophecy. So it becomes a scholarly activity for a very small number of people. What is also interesting is um, how you po pointed out in the book that uh, even though uh, Newton disparaged uh, or condemned rather strongly imagination, uh, I mean, there is a sense in which he engages in it, uh, especially at the beginning, and it somehow colors his, uh, the way he, uh, he sees things. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, for us today, some of his uh, conspiracy theories can sound as if they're born of a very rich imagination. So there is the question of uh, what is the importance of imagination in, in his thoughts, uh, even despite um, his claims and his, uh, his uh, stand against it. Yeah, I, there's a part early in the book <clears throat> where I, um, I I talk about his early, you know, some of his earliest research in natural philosophy. I think his very first experiments are the ones he does on his own head, um, where he puts, you know, a, a bodkin uh, or a, a brass plate under his eyeball and starts squeezing his eyeball into different positions because he wanted to know what the what contribution was made by the brain or the mind to seeing. Um, as opposed to the contribution of the eyeball or the real world itself. I mean, the, those, those are extraordinary experiments. Um, you know, even to, even to imagine <laughs> doing those experiments on the imagination are, are, really, are really strange. Um, and the, the, the power of the imagination uh, functions in an interesting way throughout Newton's career, uh, both, as a, both as a research project but, but also as this, this, um, this mode of being that, that needs to be removed if you are to find, uh, if you are to find the truth. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of things one can say. I mean, I, I said to Joe earlier on, I mean, one of the things that interests me about Leibniz um, in the leibniz clark dispute and certainly in Leibniz's response to Newton and the priority dispute in the second decade of the 18th century is um, Leibniz's really brilliant um, dismantling of the metaphysical claims of Newton really I mean it, it's 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 in correspondence with Clark but it's it's the you know the the unpicking by Leibniz of the 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 metaphysical uh, underpinnings of Newton's uh, Principia Mathematica in terms of absolute space, um, force, uh, atoms, the void, uh, the sensorium, and so on, which Leibniz comes to see or almost diagnose <clears throat> as, as either a kind of sickness or a, as part of some ludicrous cult. And he also I think in responding to Newton's claims about Newton, about Leibniz's bad behavior, you know, Leibniz begins to see just what a horrible person uh, Newton is, you know, and, and what a, what a, an arch manipulator. Um, I think it was you, Joe, who pointed out that um, the, there's a strong sense that Newton behaves in the way that he claimed Athanasius did in terms of manipulating <clears throat> disciples for some 
um, for some monstrous end. That's what Leibniz sees about Newton. And one of the things I, I point out, it's an easy win in the book, is that even Newton's friends said he was paranoid, uh, that he was prone to conspiracy theories. Um, and his enemies certainly thought Newton was prone to conspiracy theories and was prone to creating um, cults of idolaters uh, around particular, what Leibniz calls fictions. So there's, there's, there's a lot of kind of sociology and psychology under, underlying the surface, which I think is, is, worthy, of being, is worthy of being picked out. But, but it's worthwhile remembering, of course, you know, the, um, the, the way Newton deals with uh, church history uh, by using forensic analysis, that's what the Orthodox do. You know, the Orthodox go through and they show how um, the Arians, that is the anti-Trinitarians, corrupted scripture um, and they did this and they did that. So Newton is only inhabiting a kind of counter or mirror universe and use, but, but uses the same techniques. And I think, you know, one has to divide what's probably his own personal uh, proclivities as a conspiracy theorist and someone who his friend said was paranoid, we have to set that aside for one minute and say the kind of techniques he used uh, to analyze the past were ones that were widely available to a, a wide range of people. I mean, what, um, you know, th th that is the, the forensic testing of uh, claims that were made in the past. When you put the two together, you, you get this, this massive conspiracy that Newton thinks happened um, at, the, at the core of Christianity that, that won't be resolved until the end of time, you know, which is in 2060 or, or just soon after 2060, as Newton said, which is not far away. We have a number of questions and a number of directions in which the discussion might be going. Um, and since quite a long time ago, Dolores asked a row of questions that are that that were kind of uh, branching off from one of your um, fr from your discussion about Newton and prophecies. Maybe that's that's a point to go back for a moment because. Again, if you talk about Daniel and the prophecy of Daniel, you see again Newton doing something that apparently other people were doing as well, but in a very, very different way. And, um, and Dolores was raising Bacon here and Bacon's interpretation of, of Daniel. Dolores, if you want to intervene. So it's, um, hi Rob. So it's, um, so it's clear that in, in, in your book, you say that uh, Newton really didn't want to, he's, he's a very private person, but yet he's thrust into this position of being president of the Royal Society. So everything he says has to be guarded. Um, and there are, you know, there are the usual sort of parallels between Bacon and prophecy and Newton and prophecy. But I, um, but, um, I, think, I think I'm right. In, in thinking because of your interpretation of Newton is that he's so particular, he considers himself such a particular person at such a particular time that even though um, textually um, scholars might say, well, in some ways um, Newton is carrying out the, the sort of Baconian pro program of you know, increasing knowledge of Daniel 12.4, but how did he see himself? Did he see himself as such a particular person that he wasn't really part of any larger program than anyone else could have set out? Um, um, and, and for that reason, did it, did it have an effect on the Royal Society and his presidency? I think that's a really good question um, because I think that a large part of uh, it, just in general, the the, the move, uh, if we if we can imagine this, uh, the, the move from a, a, an older way of thinking about the passage of time to a newer way of thinking, uh, is is clear through the ways in which contemporaries of Bacon and Newton situate themselves within sacred history. Hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, the the, the Baconian 
uh, appeal to Daniel 12.4 is, is certainly, I mean, it, it's easily read off. We, we, we know it's the most famous um, reflexive statement that there is in the history of science, you know, multi uh, transible and tetau gibitur scientia, you know, that we, we have the, the compass uh, print and so on. People are traveling to new worlds. Now is the time. Now is the time. It's in prophecy. Right. We are here now. We are prophesied. Right. Newton isn't quite like that. New Newton um, is, N Newton's self situation is much more personal. Um, I think that there are other ways in which he situated uh, his his work in a in a kind of sacred history, which, which I think is different, and and we see that in his comments on the physical end of the world, um, which is another way he, uh, which I which I take to be a slightly different thing, uh, where he talked about the the comet of 1680 ultimately right, right. Uh, crashing into the sun and destroying mm -hmm. the, the the planets that come out from the sun but I, I I think what's fascinating in this has always fascinated me about Newton is is the uh, tension between humility and uh, not arrogance but um, great self-confidence I mean one of the things about Newton that, that is obvious is that uh, the, the, this ethic of independence and of being special uh, it is it expresses itself in, in in the view that he can do things, that he's chosen to do things, that 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 the world is comprehensible and he can do it. The world is intellectually comprehensible because we are created in the image of God. I think that's absolutely important for Newton as it is for many other natural philosophers of, of, of the time. Um, the, there's a I, I think with regard to the uh, the uh, arrogance, uh, humility line, um, that there's something about the publication of Principia, which is, I think, peculiar because it, it is the alpha and omega of natural philosophy. I think it's very interesting that uh, in the decade after Principia is published, there's a great despondency around some parts of Europe. Uh, people want to give up because Newton's done everything and all that's left is to fill out some bits and pieces uh, and, we, and we, we know that turns out to be uh, to be completely false but Newton sometimes talks as if um, sometimes he talks in a humble way as if he's um, you know uh, not done very much but he's laid down the basis for future work uh, and other people will come after him and extend uh, his methodology into the life sciences uh, into natural history and so on and so forth. So there's a kind of hegemonic uh, imperialist uh, thought to Newton sometimes. And then at other times, uh, I think he thinks that his achievement is quite limited and that there are parts of natural, I mean, in, in the same way as Locke does, you know, that there are some parts of natural philosophy that are just not susceptible to the kind of mathematicism uh, that Newton has put forward. And I think Newton is, uh, he, he, he vacillates between those two, those two different views. But, but those views of humility and um, not arrogance, as I said, but, but self-confidence, they're, they're situated in time. I think that's, a, that's very important that they, that they have to be seen not just as psychological characteristics, but about the view of where you stand in history, mm. you know. Uh, and right from the word go, you know, the very first, um, article that Newton published, which is is wonderful, uh, always wonderful. The the 1672 paper on light and colours. You know when when he wrote his cover letter to Henry Oldenburg at the start of February. You know he said to Oldenburg, "I've had this uh, paper lying about me for some time. Um, it's directly related to the reflecting telescope, which Newton had just had." passed on by Barrow to the Royal Society. So I've had this theory of light and colors by me for some time. I don't set any store by it, but <laughs> it is the most considerable, uh, the oddest and most considerable detection in nature hitherto. So I don't set any store by it, but it's the greatest discovery in the history of science. <laughs> and that, that balance between the two, I think is right, something right. that he finds very difficult to pull off. 
Thanks, thanks. Can we, uh, can we return now a little bit to the anti-Trinitarian aspect of, uh, um, of Newton's thought? And uh, we have a question from Cynthia Pyle on uh, his, um, his knowledge of Unitarianism. Cynthia, can you ask the question, please? Sorry, this is really quite uh, uninstructed, but um, I wondered if uh, he knew Unitarianism and whether he, he corresponded with any Unitarians uh, east of, in the Eastern part of Europe, or whether he was aware of that. I've heard him called a Unitarian and I wondered uh, the details of that, thank you. Uh, yeah, look, again, that's a really interesting question. It goes to the heart of um, some of the things, some of the approaches that I wanted to take in in the book. Um, the, the, the answer to your question, I think, is uh, in the latter half of his career. So in the early 18th century, uh, he was aware of and was visited by people from Central Europe uh, who were members of Transylvanian uh Unitarian communities, Unitarian being construed in a in a general way. Um, so word had got out that he was um, in some sense amenable to some of these radical ideas. Uh, but as far as I know, and there are one or two people who know more about that than I do, as far as I know, we, we don't have evidence of um, the conversations between Newton and, and these uh, and these people. Um, He's aware, of course, of Socinian writings. I mean, Newton, one of the things about Newton is he, he's a bit like Bacon, in, in only in the sense that um, everything that's useful is brought into the Newtonian hopper. Um, and I think it's, it's fascinating that the Roman Catholic writings are very useful to Newton. A lot of Roman Catholic writings are very useful to Newton. They're just as, they're just as useful as Socinian writings. Um, when he wants to make his case, uh, he he uses yeah, whatever. Oh, sorry, Rob. But could you explain what Socinian is, just for people um, who don't know anything about? Uh, yeah, so, so Socinianism is 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 a is a radical. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it subordinate. Socinian writings um, are from the uh, the the sort of Polish Italian uh, Faustus Socini in the late sixteenth century. Um, who wrote uh, works that were that were radically humanist with regard to the nature of Jesus Christ? So Jesus Christ, um, his his historical role is is definitely the Son of God, but he's a man, um, and his his role is in the main one of uh, an exemplar. Uh, so he, he's. I mean, there are other people who know <coughs> more about Socinianism than. Uh, than I do in detail, but essentially Socinian writings uh, for Newton, uh, that, that is writings by Polish Socinians and others are useful to Newton because they give him techniques for understanding uh, the Bible. They give him techniques for understanding how it is that um, texts that are claimed by the Orthodox to be supportive of the Trinity are in fact either misunderstood or their later interpolations. And that goes, as I said earlier, for 1 Timothy 3.16 and 1 John 5.7. Uh, and you know, a, a lot of Newton's research was done in, in the service of finding the oldest manuscripts. And Newton had a, a deep commitment to the view that the oldest manuscripts were ones that tended to lack these two texts along with a whole series of other texts that were conventionally invoked by um by the by the orthodox and the analysis of those two texts was the uh was the content of his two letters he sent to john locke in november 1690 um which i deal with in, in a whole chapter because it's a wonderful um it, it's, it's an extraordinary sort of dance between the two of them trying to probe what each other knows, I think, without maybe revealing to each other that, that they have grave doubts about the Trinity. Although you can hardly read what Newton says and, and think that he doesn't have grave doubts about the Trinity. The second point um, 
is, is really about how we class Newton. You know, uh, is, is he, um, you know, what was he? Was he a Unitarian? Was he a natural philosopher? Uh, was he a theologian? Um, was he a Cambridge Don? Was he a scientist? Um, what was he? How do we, how do we use these labels? Uh, and I tried to uh, link uh, uh, my kind of own unwillingness to pigeonhole him to Newton's own unwillingness to be a member of any sect. Uh, and I think that to, to resist what in the jargon is called essentialism, to, to resist saying he was this, you know, so he was uh, an Arian, so a follower of Arius, the um, fourth century uh, anti-Trinitarian presbyter. Um, I, I wanted to resist doing that and, and, um, and leave the kind of dynamics of Newton's um, uh, independence uh, to, not, not to speak for itself, because th that's a dereliction of historical duty, but I wanted to bring out the way in which he, he cannot be subsumed within any, in, in, within any one sect or, or described in any one term. But if, but if, if we're nominalist about this um, and we, we wear these terms lightly, then yes, he was a Unitarian. Um, he, he was a Unitarian, but he was not a member of any Unitarian church. And, you know, probably would have thought that um, uh, such churches uh, may have been divisive, politically divisive in, in, in a post um, glorious revolution England. Uh, Rob, I just to just to follow up a bit on on your labels yes. and uh, the way to use labels regarding Newton. And I know that that Grigora has also something to say along these lines. Again, I would like to put him in a context of other natural philosophers and reformers of knowledge of the 17th century. Because you, one might say, you know, Bacon also had many heads or many hats for his head. He was also interested in natural philosophy, in reforming knowledge. He was interested in politics and theology and so on. Um, Descartes and Hobbes and Leibniz had all these personas in these yep. different fields. And yet one has the feeling that in the case of Descartes and Hobbes and Bacon, there is a sort of unity which is given by their philosophical projects that even very different, even if, even if they had multiple projects, even if they had different hats for their head, uh, they were ultimately philosophers. Was Newton something else here again? Was he original and different or was he also a philosopher? Um, I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, um, I, I don't, uh, I, I said at the start that, uh, that, that there's no other uh, natural philosopher or, or person <laughs> who we, we might class as a natural philosopher who, who did uh, this level of um, theological work, I, I think, that, that we know of. There are certainly lots of um, divines who are natural philosophers, but, I, but it's important to Newton that he was uh, a, a layman. I mean, he worked hard to remain a, a layman. Uh, and we, we know this from, uh, a, a, again, a, ultimately most of these anecdotes come from Newton himself. <clears throat> so we, we could be, um, we could be mildly skeptical about why it is that he told these anecdotes. But even if we're mildly skeptical, um, the, the reason he told people that he had resisted uh, taking holy orders, um, the reason he did that was because he wanted to make it clear to people um, that his lay status gave him a degree of independence. It, to, to answer your question directly, my, my view about Newton is that he, he wanted to be a, a layman um, who uh, uh, in some sense dabbled in some of these things. I, and I, I mean that in, 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 a, in a peculiar way um, because he's obviously committed to his views. You know, he, he cares deeply about his views. Um, he doesn't like to be attacked. Um, 
whenever he uh, offers a, a sort of friendly line, you know, if, you, if you've got anything you want to say about this, then please write to me. He doesn't really want you to criticize his stuff. He doesn't want any criticism at all. He's deeply passionately committed uh, to uh, what, he, what he writes. Um, but, I, I, but I do think he's, his lay status gives him a degree of, of freedom. Um, and, you know, maybe that, that fits into some other views of the, um, of, of the, 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 the nature of the change between natural philosophy and, and religion in, in the period. Uh, I don't know. I, the second thing I'd say is, I, I'm, I'm, I started off by saying I'm deeply opposed to connectionism, um, because I think that that commits the fault that Newton um, saw in other people. Uh, so the connectionism being the, the a priori assumption that everyone's uh, thoughts uh, at some point are connected um, either by, you know, most crudely by the person, him or herself, uh, or by some kind of methodological approach or by some kind of conceptual uh, uh, linkage. I, I don't think that we can assume a priori that that's the case for anybody or everybody. And I think in the, in the case of Newton, um, as a response to positivism, um, a lot of people in the 1960s, 70s and 80s said everything is connected. So that they, they said all, all of Newton's religion is of a piece with his natural philosophy. And I, I responded to that quite early in my, my career by saying, I, you know, that, that one, should, one should assume that in the beginning there's chaos. Uh, in the beginning, there's heterogeneity, and the um, coherence or similarity emerges from what's originally chaos. But I, obviously, I should be worried that that's an imposition of my own, an a priori imposition of my own on on the materials. I, d I don't know, but it's um, it, it's at least it's at least tactically useful doing history not to assume um, that everything is connected. Um, I I would. I would suggest that it's interesting and significant often to look to see how uh, people divide up um, their worlds from each other. I mean, when I teach Galileo the letter to the Grand Duchess, you know, that, that's something we, we look at uh, in, in detail uh, as, you know, as a, as a pivotal moment in the disciplinary relation between uh, natural philosophy and, uh, and theology. Um, and I, I see not just divisions between disciplines, but also subdivisions between different disciplines as well. And I think, you know, if, if you wanted to be a, a sort of a Foucault, a, a Foucault of this kind of thing, I would suggest that, you know, in, in, in the same way that he talks about epistemes, I think disciplines exist. Uh, I think disciplines are, are more important and robust sometimes than, than individual authors. Um, and I think, you know, that we can understand a, an immense amount about the scientific revolution by looking at the, 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 the changing ecologies of the relations between uh, different disciplines. Uh, I would like to add two short points. Uh, you mentioned the Leibniz Clark correspondence. Do you have an explanation why he was so fond of the sensorium de analogy? Uh, it's something completely unscriptural and metaphysical in a sense. And in line with your anti-connectionism, <laughs> do you think it would be a good uh, hermeneutical choice to keep se uh, separate the metaphysical God, the one studied by Maguire, from the God of uh, Abraham and Isaac, the scriptural God? Do you think it would be a good idea to separate them? Like, for instance, the sensorium God from the biblical God. Um, I, I think it's very possible to see uh, an individual uh, treating a, a, a the, the same topic from different perspectives. Um, and you see that, obviously, in the, with the soul. You know, natural philosophers... Uh, 
individual scholars in the early modern period all the time say, you know, we can treat the soul from uh, a metaphysical perspective, from a medical perspective, or from a natural philosophical perspective. It's quite, you know, the same person can treat the soul according to different disciplinary requirements. Um, uh, wh wh whether, <laughs> wh whether one should separate these things uh, in Newton's case, I think is is uh, an interesting question. I mean, clearly, clearly there are different disciplines that Newton is treating God with, and and if it's useful for us to treat them differently, um, then then that should be the case. Uh, I don't have a you know w without going into it in more detail, I don't have an answer. At, at some level, obviously, uh, it's the same God. Uh, Newton is treating aspects of uh, of divine power and divine presence in in different ways according to the demands of the of the discipline uh, i think um in in that case uh and i i can you remind me what the first part of your question was the Do you have an explanation for him being so fond of this yeah, sorry I, I i deliberately blanked that <laughs> <laughs> or unconsciously um isn't it anthropomorphizing God too much, attributing well, look, him a sensorium? I, I think that's a, it's a very difficult question. I think it's really significant for Newton. Um, <laughs> we're created in the image of God. Um, it gives us, uh, it, not only does it tell us it gives us a license to make certain uh, analogical jumps to uh, the way God is, but we have to be careful, according to Newton, uh, in the way that we couch this an analogizing. Um, I mean, even in the uh, and you know Leibniz picks this up very well, I think, in the Leibniz Clark correspondence. Even in the General Scholium, which is only which is a very small text, I mean, Newton uh, does a number of things that Leibniz picks up really well and you know so newton makes this uh, this uh, absurd uh claim about the sensorium which he made in uh, optique uh initially in 1706 uh he's committed to uh the idea that the the cosmos is uh just as uh it's like uh the sensorium of god um but, you know, Leibniz famously says it doesn't matter whether you say the sensorium, uh, you know, the cosmos is God's sensorium or it's just like sense God's sensorium. I mean, both of them are equally incomprehensible and equally, probably equally heretical. Um, but Newton, I mean, what Leibniz really doesn't like is, is Newton's claim <coughs> that uh, in, in a sense, Although Newton has said that we, we have a, um, we have certain licenses to grasp the way that the world really is, and that we are invited to understand God, His being an attribute, despite that being the case, um, there is this this kind of hyper accommodationism, which presents this unbridgeable gap between us as finite beings and, a, and an infinite God. That is to say, you know, God has um, engaged in a, a massive amount of hermeneutical activity to make his ineffable infinitude comprehensible to us. And all we can do in a kind of Spinozist way, all we can do is sort of uh, see the divine as various projections of ourselves, but we should be wary of that. I mean, Newton says all this in a very short space of time, but the, the, the net effect of saying all this is is to say nothing. I mean, that's what Leibniz effectively says about Newton. You know, you, you've, you've couched so many, you've got so many qualifications in what you've said about the divine and in our capacity to uh, access the being and attributes of God that we can't say anything at all um, because he's, you know, he's always going to be uh, incomprehensible to us uh, because we're, according to Newton, we're locked into this uh, anthropomorphic projectionism which newton is aware of so all these things are going on at, at, at the same time um and i why newton why newton continues with that i think is 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 worthy of a of a lot more study than i 
than I've given it, why he continues the commitment to the sensorium of God, um, I think is interesting. I mean, one thing you could say is once it's in print, he, he is not the kind of person who is going to go back and say, uh, I, I should never have said that. He, once it's in print, uh, in Latin, so therefore available to all of Europe, once it's in print, he has to defend it. Um, and he has to get his, his lieutenant, Samuel Clark, to defend it in, uh, against Leibniz. I mean, the interesting thing, as you know, is, you know, Samuel Clark is a, an excellent metaphysician. Leibniz is, is a great metaphysician. Uh, Clark has to play Newton's uh, caricaturing, uh, simplifying line, I think, to, to deal with this. Um, but Newton is, is skewered by his previous publication of something he, I bet he, he regrets. I, I was going to ask you something uh, that is, um, something that struck me about, um, about Newton's view of God. Uh, at least at the first glance, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert, is that uh, he tends to see him as a, as a presence, I mean, in uh, mainly in positive terms, um, you know, even this, this kind of anthropomorphism that you mentioned. And I was, I was just wondering to what extent can, uh, did he, um, does he refer to negative theology at all? I mean, does he, is he interested in that or, you know, ba basically yeah. just pays lip service to it? Or a, 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 yeah, a, a, a perfatic theology. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. He, he does do that sometimes. He did, he did do that sometimes. Um, uh, so he, he was very well aware of um, <clears throat> uh, this, this kind of uh, tendency. I mean, you see it in his metaphysical uh, piece, uh, De gravitatione et equipondio fluidorum, you know, on the um, the gravitation and equilibrium of fluids, the, there is some uh, via negativa uh, statements in in that. There are also um, there are also some statements like that later on in his career. But uh, w one of the things I was interested in, I, I didn't want to get into a kind of history of philosophy. Uh, debate about whether Newton was a voluntarist or an intellectualist, because I think that's a completely barren um, <laughs> approach to thinking about Newton. Um, but I, I do think that in, in some ways, uh, and you can see it with his commitment to um, the, the, the view that, that God has inscribed mathematical characters into the world, I mean that, and that we can comprehend it. I mean, this is very, this is the kind of confident side of Newton. You know, we, we are created in the image of God. Um, we have reason. Um, and we are licensed to explore nature. Um, th this goes right to the heart of Newton's anti-probabilism. You know, Newton doesn't like the idea that all we can ever have is a, is a highly probable knowledge of, of the world. Newton thinks that we can come to an absolutely certain view of the way the world is and it it has to be um through mathematics um because god is a consummate geometer but therefore he has uh inscribed the world in in mathematical terms so that um that i think is is something that allows newton to imagine or to conceive envisage that he can present a very positive view of god um you know newton if we use the um the image of the book of nature. I mean, Newton believes that he has discovered how God has um, written the book of nature. Um, that that's not a <laughs> that that's not a modest accomplishment. That that's not something that um, is is only on partly on the way towards a, a fully realized achievement. I mean, Newton uh, really thinks, and Halley and others. Uh, see this. Newton really thinks that through his own intellect, um, he has come close to understanding aspects of the intellect of God. Rob, I would like to, um, uh, I, I want to introduce Sarana's question because Sarana wanted to ask for a, for a long time a question and I, I, I think I'm going in the direction of her question if I emphasizing again 
that uh, there is a tension in what you're saying between the moment when you're saying Newton believed that he discovered God's plan for, and the moments when you're saying um, some, and, and th this in your book is, is very, very, very vividly portrayed, Newton as a problem solver. <clears throat> So Newton is not only the priest of nature, it's not only someone who believed who found the truth, but it's a fantastic purs pursuer of truth, someone who doesn't leave the track yeah. until he really increases his understanding. Yeah. And I wonder whether, you know, and, and, and somehow this, uh, this, this pursuit for truth doesn't really depend on the kind of problem or on our division on our disciplinary division. Here, he seems to pursue the truth, no matter in which direction that leads, just, you know, th there is this kind of driving force that doesn't let him sleep, eat, or talk to others until he doesn't understand better a particular problem, be that the problem of the body or the sensorium of God, or be that the problem of the uh, gravitational force or... Yeah. So there is a kind of drive towards understanding, but I want Surana to, to intervene here because I suspect she wants to ask a question um, that has something to do with, with understanding. Yes, uh, th thank you, Dana. Uh, thank you for asking my question for me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was losing your mind. <laughs> um, but I think I can add a little extra frame to it. Uh, but first of all, Rob, it's always a pleasure to listen to you. Yes, I was going into, uh, uh, into the direction that um, uh, Dana explained, but, but um, the extra frame is the following. I think that what I meant to ask initially was a question about your views of the task of the historian. Um, what is it that an intellectual historian, perhaps is the right label, does. Um, but you did, the, the sorts of things that you said about your um, quarrel with connectionism um, is partly an answer to that. Um, however, um, I, I, I would say that what Dana was describing and what you yourself call in the book, uh, Newton's um, uh, lifelong, um, uh, dedication to the to the self-imposed task of perfecting his intellect, perfecting in that, his understanding, um, is a unifying theme in all. Uh, that is, it 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 is what drives his work in all the domains um, he worked in, uh, which is to say, um, perhaps connections can be seen. Um, not necessarily at the level of uh, epistemological overlapping, uh, but at this other level, um, which is not psychological in the modern sense of the term, but is related to 17th century views of the workings of the mind, and of the duties that uh, ensue from them. Um, and I was... Um, so... If you, if you could say a bit, a, a bit more about this, but also I, I think I, I would say that it is only the intellectual, the, the intellectual historian that, that can tap into these kinds of resources. Um, to, you know, a, a, a regular, so to speak, although regular, I don't know what, what this means anymore, historian of philosophy or historian of science or historian uh, of theology that works uh, with uh, the, um, you know, within those disciplines or the historiography of those disciplines um, would perhaps not become sensitive to these kinds of issues that you're bringing out in, in the book so beautifully. Um, well, thank you for that. Look, I, I mean, one of the things to say is I, I, I don't say that there are no connections. I say that we shouldn't assume that there's a connection. I, I wanted it to appear as if, and I, I really do think this is the case, that whatever unity there is in Newton's writings emerges as a result of dealing 
first of all, with all the evidence that I amass in the book. And the, the emerging unity, if you like, is exactly what you've said. It, it, it's as if my book should have been called Never at Rest um, because the, the, the core unity comes from uh, his ethics. And I think his ethics is practical ethics. So when you say it's about intellectual history, I would say uh, yes and no. I think that the, 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 this is not just of the mind. It's also of the self and the, and the self is composed of the mind and the body. Um, I, I made a joke, I don't know whether it was in the, the book, but there's a grain of truth to it, which is if you look at the accounts Newton gave of the dangers of monasticism, about what happens when you're idle. And he said, uh, people who are idle do this, they'll always be uh, thinking of women. Uh, if you don't have something to work on, whether it's a text or a, a, an object or a project, um, that is to say, if you engage like monastics or monks in meditation all the time, you will go mad. You will go mad and you will die. It's unhealthy. It's not, so the, the, the body is uh, created by God. The godly body has been created by God for a particular purpose. And the purpose is to work. Uh, the purpose is to not be idle and it's to work on a project and it's to work on a useful project. Um, so I think it's broader than intellectual history. It's certainly intellectual history, but I, I think that the, the, the bedrock, you know, where the, the spade turns, if you like, um, is this is, is, is ethics. How that relates to his religious views was what I found very difficult because Newton, Newton is not the, the introspective kind of guy. Uh, he doesn't do emotion. He doesn't do introspection. You have to read off what he thinks about how to live one's life well from different sources. And one of those sources is actually um, the, the, the quotation that gave rise to Richard Westfall's title of his book, Never at Rest. It's no surprise that that is very closely linked to the kind of argument you correctly said I made uh, towards the end of the book which is that the, the, the godly man has a, an absolute duty uh, to work hard to perfect his understanding. That, that is in Newton's view, that's not the view of everybody, but Newton's version of Protestantism is about hard work, um, which of course is in, in, a, in a classic Protestant fashion, it's hard work directed towards the world and to the self at the same time, uh, to perfect oneself. I mean, that there is a, there's a duty to do that. The, the joke I made is that, that Newton did all these things, you know, calculus, uh, religious study, principia, all this stuff, to stop thinking about women. Um, uh, or, or put another way, it's, a, it, it's an offshoot of the practice of the self that stops being idle, right? I, I think there's a grain of truth to that. I, I don't mean it in a, an offhand way. I mean that what comes first is his religious commitment. And I have to say, uh, one or two people uh, have picked up on this. I am not a religious, I am not religious. I'm not religious. I'm an anthropologist. I'm a historical anthropologist of someone who lived in a world completely different from me. And I started off, you know, being excited by the, you know, many, many years ago, decades ago, another century, another millennium. I started off because it was difficult because this stuff was so abstruse and bizarre. That's what interested me. But it's the, it's the hard technical work that Newton did to become a master of his field. That also links everything he does. I mean, Niccolo Guicciardini's just said that in a comment on my, on my book, and I think that's right. I tried to bring that out in my book, but maybe I didn't enough. I mean, this man thinks that he has the, the right and the duty and the capacity to be an expert in every field he goes into but he's not a professional he's a layman and that gives him a particular status i think well thank you rob um <laughs> we have pretty much come to the end of two hours yeah. um i was wondering if you want to say a few words in conclusion and then we'll sum up um by way of conclusion um yeah, look, I, I, uh, I spent a long time thinking about writing the book. 
um, it's related to the uh, Newton project. I think that one, one thing you might consider, of course, is which I'm not in a position to do is in 20, 30 years time is the extent to which that book should be seen as the product of the availability of all those materials, because it, it would otherwise be impossible to do some of the research I did without the materials that the, the people who worked on the Newton project produced. You know, I, I used to, in the late 1980s, I spent years on a microfilm taking notes in pencil. Um, so I spent three years doing all that. And the, the kind of work that I took three years to do can be done in one day with all the materials that are available online. So one of the things that you might consider is, is whether, uh, whether it was worth it. Um, <laughs> no, but one of the things you might consider is, is, is the, or are the digital um, residues, the, the digital origins of my work visible in, in the work? Um, it, that, that's not something that I can tell. I don't know. I, I know that, that dealing with that vast amount of information um, and going into detail, looking at how, you know, different drafts are related to each other, that's absolutely impossible without the digital uh, digital world. So, you know, what one hopes is that um, my work, Bill Newman's work, the work of Nicola Guicciardini um, and others coupled with the availability of all of the materials can help people uh, do better work on Newton, not just on Newton, but on other people as, as well. And that, that's what I, that's what I hope. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. But uh, thank you for having me as well. I should say thank you for having me and, and listening. <laughs> this is a great manifesto for digital humanities, which is something that is also close to my heart. <laughs> uh, of course, we don't know what Newton would have thought about it. I mean, uh, if he's, <laughs> he's happy about all this spreading of uh, his, uh, his knowledge into, uh, to everyone. Uh, but maybe he would see it as, you know, his new opportunity to uh, to spread the word of uh, of his well, his own gospels. Um, yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, he's uh, finally published for the first time. It's all published as he wanted, yeah, as you said. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yes, I mean, thank you, Rob, for for your efforts in bringing that to the public, and uh, um, thank you for tonight. I mean, this was a very interesting discussion and uh, we probably will have to leave it with Newton as a mysterious, but also uh, uh, fascinating and um, let's say a personality that there is so much more to discover about uh, and the call to, to do more research on him and uh, his, his views. So, uh, uh, thank you, everyone. And, yeah, thank uh, you. Maybe there will be more Newton in the future. We'll see how <laughs> it <laughs> is. But uh, there is always Newton to think about. So uh, uh, that's what that's what his legacy is. Right? He keeps on giving. Exactly. There is there is no end to to how much <laughs> you can look at Newton, and this is probably what he wanted. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks again for having thank me. Thank you very much. All okay. right. Thank you, I hope to see you soon in, in real life. Yes. yes. Thank <laughs> you. The end of the COVID. Thank right. you.